Going someplace that they ain't going back Highway choppers coming over the hill Hot soup on a campfire under a bridge Shelter line stretching around the corner Welcome to the new world order Family sleeping in their cars in the southwest No home, no job, no peace, no way The highway is alive tonight Nobody's telling nobody about where it's all going I'm sitting down here in the campfire light Waiting on the coast Tom Joe. Keith Sacola, welcome to Resilience Radio. <laughs> All right. Hello, Buju. So it sounded great if I turn my mic down or off. Then there's oh. no interference in quality. So feel Oh, free. that's good. Maybe that's the secret, hey? So then there's no competition of sound. So feel free to slip into song whenever you'd like. Okay, uh, uh, that's interesting concept, uh, Jennifer, because if, if you would turn your mic down, you'd create no latency. I like that. All right. I, I know a thing or, or one thing. Keith Sacola, I am so glad to have you because you are a local treasure and a treat. You played here at our World Fest, so you have a ton of existing super fans. Oh, that, that's one of the funnest festivals in, in uh, America and during the summertime. I really enjoy myself up there and, well, and going up there. Can. Yeah, it's great, man. Well, we love having you because you rock. And, and it'd be, I think the future, you know, when, when festivals, if they come back in, in, in whichever way they can, um, entertaining people is really a great connection. I think that's what I feel up there is that connection that people get your music, Jennifer, like you can make a joke about Indian history and it's almost like you can talk code and people will understand, you know, your humor and, and you don't have to explain it so much. And, and so there's pockets of enlightenment around America and that, that certainly is up there in Northern California. Well, that's a huge compliment because people yeah. move up here to not be like the rest of America, you know? They I think you could tell where people dig a little deeper, you know, where a Native American music, where it's more understood and played, is almost um, places where you can see where integration and real um, um, racial harmony more exists more, you know, where people accept more the history uh, maybe some of the guilt they've learned to deal with some of the American guilt and uh, it's they'll they'll they're more aficionados of music of the heart you know and people and so you see them little pockets you know where uh, native music is played right on the air you know on radio stations and the station up there and in, uh, in, in Northern California have been part of that building that uh, native music block Yay. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you are part of our native music rock block. <laughs> but Keith, since this COVID chaos and you being an active musician, what the heck? Like, what, how, how the heck have you been? Well, at first, you know, I was working on my podcast, and uh, it's an audio version, uh, Native Americana, it's called. And uh, I was working in Ely, Minnesota, like at, at March, around March. And I, when I go on the road, I'll sprinkle the work, you know, like to maybe do a little few interviews. And I did that. I was going out there and interviewing some traditional singers and, and uh, folk singers and things, along with doing my gigs. And uh, I was kind of wondering, is it going to be canceled or what? And around March 11th, is, things changed. And... Uh, uh, we did a few shows and then I came home from Ely, Minnesota. I was kind of worried, you know, from Minneapolis to Phoenix and here I am. And uh, immediately upon landing, you know, the next morning I got up and started walking 
and walking miles, miles, and and it's it's persisted ever since the last four months. And uh, it's kind of odd, Jennifer, for to be a musician because this is the first summer um, where I haven't been home to Minnesota either, you know, or we haven't swam in Lake Superior or any of the lakes. And I'm going, I'm going to be 63 in a few weeks. So that's about almost how long it's been. But I, I'm kind of finding a, a, a resolution, a peace, a harmony. I see this almost like a, it's a rites of passage. In a, a Anishinaabe culture, we talk uh, of uh, the, the word for boy is givi wens, and the word for man is yinini. And so they're different words. Similar thing is uh, the word for a uh, woman is equence, a little woman, and a woman is equa. Same word, but different endings kind of so the rites of passage for a man is a little different a, a boy is we're born boys and so we kind of come out through this rites of passage the same thing that we're going through right now the world is and uh we're going it through it together no, nor men nor women you know little people old and we're all kind of coming through this and we're coming and wondering what's it's going to be you know what what's the new norm where is it going to be? Sometimes I'm wondering, is this how it ends even? Is this the beginning? You know, and so there's that certain uncertainty. But also, I think if we prepare, our rites of passage will come out stronger. It does seem like uh, this is a puberty temper tantrum for, for the whole planet. Yeah, for, yeah, it is. It's kind of like, okay, say, so go through this. And, I don't uh, want to yeah, and, and I remember doing a few shows there at the right around the uh, the time like are we gonna in like it was a Monday show and the next Monday the shows were canceled, you know like which was fine with me because I, I think for so many people native people there's so many of our elders and so many of our people that we think about you know like we don't just think about ourselves we think about okay how are we gonna affect other people or how are we connected to other people. We've always thought the intrinsic relationship between human beings and, and plants and animals and plant animals and, 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 and human beings, that interspecies communication. And so we've always been um, kind of even in a weird way enjoying the time, you know, to really, to get, to walk every day, to work out. I, yeah, I remember saying, oh, if I could just have three weeks, I'd be in great shape, you know, and now four months later, I was t I really like getting in better shape, you know, like I think you yeah, human beings and males, we can flatten our own curve too. That's one curve that we haven't thought about. It. And so those things are, are, are odd, odd way of finding resolution into this madness and, and things. Well, there is a lot of madness. So is that madness inspiring like new music? Or are you like, oh my gosh, I've literally written a song about all this already? A little bit of it. You know, like I found uh, a lot of my activism songs uh, were about things, you know, like uh, uh, songs that I can rekindle and put right into into the, the block, you know, like uh, there's one song, I got my guitar in a, in a different tuning. But uh, it's called, I'll play a few chords of it when you turn down your, your microphone. Uh, and uh, it's called Say Your Name. And, you know, similar to the things that happened to our brother George Floyd up in Minneapolis. Um, but it kind of like, you can almost use it as a time. Say your name. Say your name Show your face Leave no trace Of the shame Tears come falling Five hundred years Prayers of our children, prayers of our children, 
take these tears. So this song is uh, written about the boarding schools and uh, even now like say their names, you know, like the whole movement of people saying their names and and doing things. I think once you're on a road of activism and righteousness, you write songs like that that can be um, rekindled and repurposed and uh, reused. Well, now I'm saying this thing like you've came up a few times, a responsibility like this COVID, you're taking responsibility for your body and your station in life. Why can't governments take responsibility for the damage of boarding school or the damage of slave descendants or the damage of why is it so hard for the government just to say we suck at something let's fix it well this is something i think we all agree with you know why why is it it's so hard and i think there's a deliberateness about it that um it transforms into like they don't want to they don't want to change you know, and, and so I think that's part of the answer. That's probably what makes it difficult, you know, like that deliberateness about uh, racism. And it's, it's, it's not even subtle. It's real deliberate. And it used to be to me that you had to kind of get to know somebody to find out how racist or crazy they were. Now everybody's proud of how racist and crazy they are. <laughs> it's so different. Well, you know, I, I, I kind of think that this division doesn't really have to exist. You know, like I think uh, rednecks and young black people can get along in America. You know what? the You know, I think they could even work together, you know, like, huh? What? Yes, it can happen, you know, like and we can protect each other. And why shouldn't it? We shouldn't have to be divided. We just want good things for our children, for life. And I think we just need to convince people to quit believing the wrong arguments, you know, that divide, divide us and create fear instead of love and togetherness, you know, like we want to arm ourselves and, and maybe kill the next door neighbor, you know, rather than get to know them. And, and a lot of times people want to create peace in the world and they don't even want to create peace with their neighbor. And so... Yeah, so like, yeah, themselves. And that's the biggest pill, I think, to swallow as a, uh, an adult male is that um, getting over yourself, you know, like to think about how much that male adults have um, messed up this world, you know, in, in so many ways, you know, the correlation between the respect of the uh, female and the mother earth and, and, the, and the woman they correlate, you know, where you'll see pollution um, and disrespecting the Mother Earth. It, it transcends into policies where maybe there's more um, rape in that area or other domestic violence towards um, women or indigenous women and things like that. And so I think for a man, for us to become Inini, like what I said, you know, that transition from becoming a boy to a man, Maybe this is what's going to make a lot of men. There were boys still, and now we're coming out of this as men, even though we're 60 years old. You know, like a lot of these white men have never been through any kind of ceremony or any kind of ritual. And so now they're getting to go through one. They're having to think about people. They're having to rethink their, their, their thoughts about what did I think was important? You know, is it all this material wealth? Is that what it is? Do I want to create more of it that I can hoard? They're coming, becoming wealth hoarders. And, right. um, you know, it's, it's a greed instead of need. And, and so we just need to convince people about this argument. And, and it ain't even hard to do because once you're on the road, it's really easy to accept enough. Okay, but I don't think that it's realistic for everybody to love each other all the time. But well, culturally, how did you guys deal with conflict? I mean, not everybody's going to agree or get along. Well, I think that's right. And I think that's what we got to agree upon, that, that, that we're going to disagree, you know, that we're going to know. And I, I'm not talking about traditional societies or anything like that. Like, I, I don't know that there were ways that they would um, work with uh, 
grievances and disagreements is um, through societal moves, through maybe the women's society or something, ostracization and things like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I agree. It's like a lot of natives, you know, like I, I wrote this song, I got my drum in the car. That's what they all say. You know, it's kind of a spoof on that, you know, like we're going to, uh, my great grandmother was a Cherokee princess. You know, that was, they all say, you know, like, uh, the check is in the mail. That's what they all say, you know, like something, things like that. And so I can get it, you know, I, you know, even when, uh, you know, even when uh, native acts appropriate too much of the mother earth into their acts, they become mostly to me, like they appropriate the, the power of the earth or the medicine of all oh, here. Medicine people, they don't have to tell you, oh, I'm a medicine man, or I'm going to sing you a healing song. You know, they don't say, say things like that. And that's true. And that is so true. But you, again, I didn't want to bring up your age, but you aging and admitting it, have you noticed like a different evolution or change in your style of music or writing that you feel a shift coming into or, or do you just, it comes out however it is, whatever age you're at? Like, what do you want to do now that you're going to die soon? Um, well, I think you're on the, the fourth hill, you know, like, and I think the best thing, you, you got to live your life so the fear of death never enters your heart. And, and that's one of the things that, that you do as you get older. You're realizing that. And, you know, like uh, I, I write songs with that very reflective line in it. Um, I'll just, I'm going to play you a little bit of a song. And this is a Grateful Dead song, you know. Like, uh, sorry about the tuning there. Um, it's a Grateful Dead song, but... It's kind of came out when I met Jerry Garcia. He became a friend of mine. And I, I know Mickey from up there, probably he's close to um, where you guys are broadcasting from. But um, it's a little bit odd, so let me bear patience with me. Sorry about that, Robin. I, I, I just took a capo off of this, so. I have to grab a different guitar. Because I realized. No, no, Biggie. I just turned it down and we can edit all this out. So don't yeah, worry. I know. That's great. My mic is off. Do what you want whenever. OK. As um, when we talked about, it was Tecumseh that said that, so live with the fear, so the fear of death never enters your heart. And, um, you know, I've written songs with that concept in mind. You know, I, I remember a few years ago, I was uh, taking care of a good dear friend who was passing away, and I went and would play guitar to him every day for yeah, hour or two and see how long he could sometimes he'd get tired but every day I kind of realized that I couldn't really guarantee him that I'd be back tomorrow or that I'd even live longer than him even though he was on his deathbed you know and so like the great spirit didn't promise us another day and so like that's where I put into this song uh, I'll, I'll sing a John's band plays big boss man not fade away Alabama get away Casey Jones and Cassidy Dark Star and Sugary Friend the Devil Staggerly 
place is on far from me Told me one time that now's the time you Better start living Let the sunshine shine The great spirit didn't promise us another day Better start living. You better be grateful today. Some say we're Jerry's kids. Through us, he lives. I still can hear him say that music is the way. Play a D, play an A Down a deep, dark hollow Make the die wolf growl Hear the wharf rats howl You told me one time And now's the time You better start living let the sunshine shine The great spirit didn't promise us another day You better start living You better be grateful today I love it. Well, that song reminds me of another one of your songs I enjoy called Life. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. yes. No, you can't do yes. Yes. <laughs> I think, you know, I read this novel down here in Arizona is called Yes is Better Than No. And the whole premise, Robin, was uh, this uh to Odom woman, they used to be called the Papagos that lived down near Tucson in the desert. And they have some great music called chicken scratch music or walla music. And it's, uh, it sounds like Mexican polka, but it's Indianized. And it's just wonderful. But the novel setting is uh, this woman from the Odom nation, she wins a house uh, or like a swimming pool. She wins a swimming pool, you know, like, and at the same day she wins her swimming pool, she gets evicted from her house. And uh, so uh, she build, has a, they build a swimming pool and then she moves into the swimming pool, has them put boards in that. <laughs> it's a crazy setting, but the whole premise is yes is better than no. You know, like never, then it's an actual book called Yes is Better Than No. And, Give um, it a Google, folks. Yeah, yeah. And so um, that song is a, a fun one to sing. And, uh, I know we're doing music more and I, I like to talk about it because so much of music is intrinsic to life. And this one I had a lot of fun with. I was down and recorded in LA, the last version with uh, the drummer from The Doors, John Densmore. And we had Luca Nelson playing, the, uh, uh, or Mika, Mika Nelson was playing the piano. And uh, we had a whole California all-star band. Got that little San Francisco sound. She sits and smokes a cigarette and pounds the aftermath. Wonder what life will bring down that forbidden path. Wants to do what she wants to, a post destination. Lacking in, she must proceed, a permanent vacation. No. Can do yes, yes, no, you can do yes. Contemplating, plain intent, intent, and contemplation. Time to wait, regulate, reflect on instant wait. 
wants to do what he wants to oppose the destination. Lacanini must proceed a permanent vacation. Ah, uh, he can do yes, yes, no. on the Animus River, a green slurpy sludge comes flowing downstream, released by the EPA, some say it's a gold mine, some say a kaleidoscope dream. See We're you back again. with Keith Sicola. I knew it was going to turn into a concert today. I knew you woke up holding a guitar. Like, I feel like you play before you brush your teeth. I, I, a little bit of both. I, I've installed a guitar with a toothbrush on here. Like, it can, like, play. And, and so, like... Why aren't yeah, we going a, on a, Shark Tank? But I think you should, you know, like, musicians, a lot of guitar players, you know, like, some great guitar players that I know, native players and, and uh, players that have come across it. The, the guitar is really close, you know, like you pull on, maybe you get a song in the middle of the night or something like that, you know, and want to write it down. I know, I figure if it doesn't come to me during regular business hours, it wasn't meant to be. Uh, like uh, Woody Guthrie said, many a great song has been written on the job. Poor, that sucks. But you, are you lucky enough to be a full-time musician or are you stuck with the job? I quit my day job in 1992. Yeah. yeah I know. And so like this is, um, you know, a lot of musicians, I think it's important as, as a musician, a musician makes money three ways before things were, when they were normal. One of the ways was... Um, through live performances, you know, which is a big part. A lot of musicians just make money that way. And uh, it really hurts. It really hurts to lose that stream of income. But two other ways that musicians make money, which are very important during this time, is, um, is um, number two is merchandising, you know, like to have merchandise for sale. Like uh, for me right now, I have this nice, vinyl you know like people can buy my music online through this uh label at uh john Giovanni, john, don giovanni out in new york um they can get my stuff and i i even sell things through cd baby and kind of in independent and so it's important for musicians to develop a merchandise line you know t-shirts stickers um cups and also what's important is for people to buy it. You know, yesterday I went and supported a, a musician from Northern Minnesota who just put out his CD. And so that, yeah, let me buy one from you, you know, like, so that's important that we generate. Number one is uh, live performances. So we're going to have to do something so uh, we can generate some money from live performances. Let me pause you because you say live performances, live performances also accompanied merchandise sales yeah yeah and, like so, hodgepodge. and so like so but merchandise could also happen and you know large part came from after the concert sales because that's when people are touched emotionally and want a piece of what just happened mm -hmm. so even if it's just a sticker i want to buy it so it's important that we get it out there and the third thing is the publishing um to get your music published and get a get you know BMI or ASCAP in America or in uh, Canada, there's uh, uh, SoCan, and and it's important that we register our songs and things. Uh, during this time, it's what sustained me is royalty checks and and working through the um, publishing. So every decade, you write a few songs. So like you know like 
even up there in over a hundred, a couple hundred songs now where we've written and, and uh, have them on my domain and, and registered with ASCAP. And so music performance, merchandising and publishing um, are really important. So publish your work now, guys and girls and, and men and women, publish them, you know, find out what it is. What is it publishing? So get your songs registered. So like if they're played in a, in a, in a domain where there is revenue generated, um, it happens, you know, things are different too. Like streaming, you don't make as much money, but you do make money. It's almost like you got to stream 10,000 views to get a Dollar. buy one CD. So it ain't that feed. Well, um, I just heard from Dreesus the other day that CD baby, and YouTube pay more than streaming on Spotify. So learning those little things like, hey, if I have a choice to listen to music, I want to go to one that's paying, paying my pal. But let's slow it down because you are not new to this game, this, this music lifestyle. Where can people buy your music? I'm sure you got like 20 CDs, right? How many albums do you oh, have? Sokola.com. I have a website. Um, that's one way. And there's links to that deep Don Giovanni who has links in everything from, you know, what you mentioned, all the, the platforms and things. And so I'm pretty easy accessible. I, I like to still creating my own label. Um, it, it, that's what I did Robin from the very start. I, I kind of like this idea of, a, of Akina. Uh, it's an Ojibwa word with, which means the earth or which means everything, all life. So it means all. And so I published myself under my own music publishing called Akina Music Publishing. And um, I did it since the 90s. And I put, released all my stuff independently. And I've sold a lot of albums, um, CDs and things that through that. I remember when I first put on a cassette of Indian cars, I played at the Denver Indian Center. And I made a hundred of them and I sold all of them on the same weekend. Wow. And so I was like, wow, I made more money from merchandising than, you know, the money they gave me to play as a performer. And so um, I realized how important that was, you know, like from an, from a, a lesson that you wouldn't like study or, or like how do I merchandise yeah. myself or market? You just learn as being an enthusiastic musician, like let's have mixed stickers. Let's put a CD out. Let's write this song. You get kind of excited, you know, and it just boils over into all these other activities. And ideas. Well, we need to, you brought up Indian cars. So since you are a legend, Indian cars, the song has become a legend, but it's also become a cautionary tale. Cody Blackbird, said he asked you if he could cover that song and you said yes and then he covered that song and his indian car didn't work for like a year that's good <laughs> no i don't know um See, so now i'm scared to play that song because i need my car to run oh uh, you have to maybe he didn't offer tobacco or something like that i don't know how much of that right. that urban myth uh, exists or something like that but we love cody <laughs> Well, all I'm saying is I'm I'm very scared of that song now because it's like waiting for triple A just yahweh yah hey yah hey you know it's it's bad. It's really remember, bad when that song is in your head for forty five to sixty minutes waiting for a tow. I remember the um the UFC fighter from Arizona, she came out with that song and um she was fighting in the, the title fight and uh maybe after you can look up her name again i f i, I want to uh, see if it helped her win or not yeah yeah that's what i did she won and so like i was really like oh no i hope she doesn't lose don't lose don't lose you know like i was all for her and i still am man she's really great it's scary i think we are friends on facebook i do forget her name but i see i don't hit people because i don't like getting hit yeah. So I do the slap boxing. I've pulled a little hair in my day, but I'm not, I'm not, she, she scares me. I like it. Well, yeah, you know, it's funny because I, I look kind of like a rough character. So like, so, so sometimes people say, man, you must've been in a lot of fights, you know? And I, you know, I have a, I have a, 
I, I love music. I love uh, educating people. I'd rather um, play music and things like no, that. No, you're our squishy, sweet, sensitive artist. Yeah. So you got to be kind of like that, you know, like, and, and uh, the, the song itself, it's kind of become an essence of uh, Indian culture in the sense of it speaks a lot of codes where people get it, you know, like um, a sticker says Indian power, it's stuck it on my bumper, it holds my car together. It's kind of like that, the richness of this poorness, um, the, the, the beauty of something that we don't have to see so much, but we know. But also it's the, the drive to be with our people and part of something, no matter what. We're not gonna let, oh, I don't have a nice car, I don't have a nice outfit, or I don't have a nice thing to stop us from going to the powwow or the party. <laughs> well, that's a great way to put it, you know, like this cover. Yeah. It shows like the um, car, I remember when we, put it together, you know, all the things in there, the full moon singers, the, the drum, the guitar. I've always said the guitar was like the little brother of the drum, the native drum. And so for me, if I've treated the guitar like a drum and uh, it's really created a, a path for me, um, which is different, I think. A lot of our people get more known by when the white man puts them in a movie or puts them on a poster or exploits him. Yes. And so for me, the the path has been a longer one, but it's been real because it's become from intrinsic the native country. And so it sticks around too. It doesn't just like like saccharin or sugar. It, you know, it's like the real stuff like that's it in wild leave rice. A weird taste in your mouth. Yeah, and so like it's good. And 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 so I think that's what artists are doing too. Other native artists are on that path. But you said guitar and drum but you're a flautist a fluter as well oh yeah I so which which one like which one do you default to the guitar oh yeah you got to i mean like to me i think everybody's gotta um has to uh like every everybody should play the flute. It, it shouldn't be like this mystical, magical thing. In fact, the flute is one of the most easiest instruments to play. It's a pentonic scale, so you know, like you can pick it up and play it. And, and so I, I put a lot of energy. Um, and I'll back. To, I'll tell you the story about why I play the flute. But uh, first, let me play it for you a little bit. Oh. See, the, see, this thing has to be, and I love getting my flutes hot when I record them. I put, a, put them in the sun or I put a, a hair blower in them and get them really nice and hot. And then when you blow them, they really like, they're really like sensitive. See, this amateur, it can you actually, you can drag down a, a flute into different pitches. And, the, and the, the flute, it has a lot of songs to me. I, I, what I like to do when I, when I go out in the forest in the woods is I'll, I'll, I'll bathe the flute in the river or the stream, and then I'll put it in the pine trees at night and let the wind blow through it all night long. And the next day it's like supercharged with the spirits of the land I, I, I put a flute in a cave in Arizona for a whole year. I hid it up there and I climbed up there the next year and got it just to see what songs come out of the flute. Okay, here's why I play the flute because I was a harmonica player for the longest time. And, see, I uh, thought you had to play the flute because you were like legally Indian or something. I don't know. <laughs> I think everybody should. You know, like um, there's stories of when DeSoto came through the Cherokee Nation, he was greeted by thousands of flute players playing the same melody. Um, there's a lot of controversy. Is the flute, was it indigenous to America or did it get introduced here? And uh, ethnomusicologists will argue that it always was the, the areophones in some form or another. Everybody it, had the flute and the drum. Yeah. 
and uh, so it's a pentonic scale. I used to really blow on this a lot. And in the 19, late 80s, I noticed my hearing on this side was getting worse and worse. And long story short is I had a tumor in my brain and it had to get it removed. And um, I used to blow this thing. And uh, this is why I got a crooked smile. Um, I lost hearing in this ear. And um, I started playing the flute instead of the harmonica and it brought healing to me. Oh. It healed me in a different way. Um, and even now what's happening to me, um, the last eight years or so is I'm, my mind is rewired to pitch. So I can hear pitches in my head like I haven't been able to in the early 90s and even the early 2000s. I'm starting to rewire so I can really hear the pitch. And if it gets too loud, it gets hard for me because I can't hear myself. And so I, I really refrain from playing too much rock and roll hard with, you know, just because um, I want to hear. And so this is why I play the flute. It's a healing instrument. And I think this is why it brought so much healing to me. And, and I can play it in, in such a fashion that I'm not after playing fancy I'm more after tone. I'm more, more after vibrato. I'm more after what do the um, stars sound like at night? I'm more after these universal sounds like a stream running through. I know how suckers sound, like suckers sound like this. Here's, a, um, here's how a, a crane or a, um, a loon sounds. So there's different communication things that you can do with birds and flutes and loons and things. And so all this became my universe, you know, like when I brought healing to my own self and my own story. I don't really talk about it too much because how does a musician with uh, one ear play music? But it happens, you start to rewire and you start hearing with your heart. And um, it almost gives you an insight of... Uh, uh, did I hear that or is this what I think I heard? And uh, sometimes you come up with the best lyrics that way, you know. Yeah, well, and a lot of slang and inside jokes come from misunderstandings. Yeah, nicknames, so, you know, your friend says something wrong once and his nickname is that forever. Yeah. So and, I'm know, just curious, I'm like, you're, you know, you're mimicking nature sounds on a flute, but now I'm like super curious are there any nature sounds you can mimic in a harmonica? Like, yeah, I'm sure you are. You know, like the train sounds. Those are is, is, an is, avalanche. Is the train to natural. Yeah, maybe. But the, I, I know a lot of guitar players who can mimic birds and mimic sounds. You know, they're pretty wild, man. That's awesome. How many flutes do you have? Um, I think it's more important is how many I've given away. Maybe. Ah. I've maybe gifted more than 30 of them because a lot of times I think they're song catchers. And so if I know a young singer, a musician, um, I'll give it to my flute, you know, like I gave a young boy uh, a flute and it made the, you know, just makes a difference to people. I, I remember giving a, a, a native drummer over 10 years ago, and I seen him a few years, and he says, oh, I wrote a bunch of songs with that flute, you know, from the drum, on the drum song. So I think it's a giving program. Maybe I have about uh, 10 or 20 of them. I play maybe a handful of them, but um, I do collect them too, and, and I, I try to turn them around and give them away. They're like eagle feathers, you know, like when they truly belong to you is when you give them away, you know, like that kind of thing. Well, I just, it's, it, there's not a lot of people in the rock and roll world that freely just give out guitars and drum sets. So I didn't know how the world of flute works, but that is very indigenous way. Like we give and receive, it's, that's what we do. We make stuff, we give it away. We, you know, we give people things out of appreciation, et cetera. 
I think if the guitars were easier to give away and we had a little bit more wealth, which um, we should, and you know, instead of starting uh, behind the starting line, like most American Indian people have to start behind the stand, starting line, the ec economic starting line. Um, man, if I had like 100 guitars, I'd give 80 of them away. <laughs> yeah. I believe you would. Yeah. yeah. I'm worried that I would just keep hoarding them because they're all so pretty. Oh, I got a great picture. I was, uh, I'm going to give you a little virtual background here. And uh, I want to tell you about this little story here. I got, I, I got a couple. Of, this is one of my favorite background stories. Can you see this? <laughs> I was in a... The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame were down, you know, the Seminoles, they own, uh, or the Hard Rock Cafes, and they have a vault down in um, in Florida. And this is where all the shipment goes, you know, like, I was right there, is uh, Tom Petty's guitar? It's right there. You could see his signature on, on it. And um, I, I was there on a private tour, and so they let me take it off the hook and play it and things like that. And... We got to see Elvis Presley's clothes and the Beatles and the Jacksons clothes and things like that. But it's all out down at the vault. It's in Florida. Um, it's a pretty cool place, but that's where they store all the, all the uh, footage, all the extra guitars where, you know, like things that they put out. I was even into uh, the magical mystery tours bus was even in there. I'm dying of jealousy. Right now. Yeah, it's pretty cool, Do but uh, we got to see all this. Guitar? What, and yeah. like hard rocks. Did you autograph one of your guitars in the hard rock, or is that still in the basement? It's still in the basement, but I got to see Jimi Hendrix's guitar, the one that he burnt. That was great. Yeah, I know. Like, here you go. Like, let's you know, like, so it's a private tour, so you, you know, like that one was burnt, but he had a few of them in there, and, and so we get, we could see, you know, the. Um, we were on a private tour and it's called the vault. It's open to the public, but you have to make appointments. I, I am boiling with jealousy and that Florida is so far away. I can't just, let's go tomorrow. You know, we just but played there right before the, uh, the, the whole thing that, that happened. These are some of my favorite backgrounds. Are you SpongeBob now? What's that? Yeah. Sponge is that SpongeBob? <laughs> no, oh, I think this is I would like to be under the sea in an octopus's garden in the shade. I was gonna do the background, but we know that the zoom audio is not the best. <laughs> so Keisa Cola, we got a few moments left, and instead of um watching you sing other people's songs in weird backgrounds. Where can we get your music? If I, let's say I want to hoard um, Key Sicola music and merchandise, where can I go? Sicola.com, S E C O L A.com. Let's say I'm too cheap and I just want to stream your music. Where can I do that? Uh, gosh, I don't know. The, uh, I know Spotify has it and um, other places have it. Um, it's out there. That's awesome. And go to Indian radio stations, it's free there. Right. Do you have any merch available right now? You know, I'm having uh, my uh, a shipment of um, T-shirts sent out to me, so I will have some tie-dye T-shirts. You know, like I say, they went extinct in the '60s. They were from the back of a hippie, and uh, I have some more, more new tie-dyes coming in. That Jerry Garcia days rubbed off on you a little too hard. Oh yeah, it's, it's a little bit of fun. But uh, I like a, like like um, I like hip stuff too, you know, mod stuff. It doesn't have to go back to the Paisley thing or that that whole thing. Um, but I think it's pretty cool. Well, I think it's cool that you're pretty cool, and I appreciate your time today, Kisa Cola. We're gonna do this again because you're Native America Americana. I'm a professional. You're Native America. Okay, take ten. Kisakola, we're going to talk again because your Native Americana podcast is going to be available on many a platform soon. Yes, it will be. Um, and it will be distributed on Native radio stations through Native Voice One 
into so like you have access to some of it and then some of the things that we're working with um robin and get it access to public radio as well we're on a mission well keith sacola it's so hard to take you seriously with that eight-year-old coloring drawing in oh the yeah background. let me get it in the back <laughs> that's a I think it's good to have humor, though. <laughs> well, it's like you're sitting here giving us advice on how to publish music and take care of ourselves and market, and you're sitting there in a fish tank. Okay, here's a little better. Then. <laughs> I just want you to come down to earth All right. long enough, to, you know, to just wrap up this interview. It's like he's ADD. The, okay, the here we go. <laughs> clock, the clock hit like 48 it, minutes and he's like, no, I'm done. No, here's, a, here's where I live in the desert. And this picture was taken the last full moon before the shutdown happened. What? That was a nighttime photo? Yeah, a nighttime photo. And uh, we went out on in the last full moon in February. Actually, it was a, in, in the beginning of March. And uh, I love doing it, Robin. I, I hike out in the desert in, uh, right around the sunset. And you watch a moon come out and you can walk back with no lights or no headlights or, or headlamps or anything. Well, I guess my it, it'd be choice. different to walk in the dark in the desert because like you bump into a rock or a tree, whatever. But if you head face into a cactus in the dark, it doesn't yeah, it's, <laughs> something different. Yeah, it's a difference, but it's a, a really mystical, magical place. You know, like it's so exotic, it, it stretches your imagination because you say, am I seeing that or is that, what's that? You know, so it's really cool. You're mystical and magical. Key Sicola, Sicola.com. I say it, dot net, Sicola.com. Are you on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter? Um, I'm on um, Facebook and Instagram. I and we should get a Twitter account, but I don't we, Twitter. I forgot the password like two years ago. <laughs> well, you know what, Robin, we love the the station up there. What you guys do, and then your presence down in the California festivals and things, you really bring a cohesiveness to the native village and the performers, and you get it down there too. And so that station, that's we're on a mission. Let's get uh, alternative stations to be really mainstream um, for fortresses of putting good music out there. You darn tootin'. Well, I don't just stalk you and support you because you're a Native American. I stalk you and support you because your music is awesome and you're super talented and your music has depth and you play instruments and you're really, to me, an easy guy to promote and support because you do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Be good. All right, well, Chi Meat Wedge, brother man, and we'll talk at you soon.